Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got one of the best guys in the history of the business. 23-time tag team champion, wow. TNA <laughs> Hall of Famer, WWE Hall of Famer, and just good guy Hall of Famer. He's a Briscoe and Bradshaw Hall of Famer. He's our <laughs> buddy. He's Mr. Devin Dudley. Devin, welcome <laughs> to the show. Hey, you're the only one I can get away with calling me Devin. You and Mr. Briscoe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Devin. I'm glad to be in that deal. But, man, listen, listen to that introduction. Holy cow. You know, <laughs> you, 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 you're you you and your, your partners, and there was a whole slew of those Dudley boys running around, but you two kind of cream of the crop kind of came up to the to the top there. But I, I, I we've had some guests on here told you, told us a little bit about your background and your history too. You were trained by uh, famous Johnny Ross, another Hall of Famer. Yeah, and were you you were there when when Mike Tyson at the gym wasn't when Mike Tyson got laid out by or he when he laid out Mitch Stone or whoever the hell that was. Mitch Green, Mitch, yeah, Blood Green. <laughs> Mitch Blood Green. Yeah, I was I was actually there at Gleason's gym after the fight, and Mitch was walking, coming in there, telling his version of the story, which we all knew was garbage. You know, <laughs> he what said, was his, there, "What was his version?" His version was that Mike snuck up on him, and that you know he would have taken Mike out if Mike didn't sneak up on him. I'm in the locker room getting trained, getting ready to go. You know train with Johnny Rods and I'm hearing all of this and all of these guys are coming in there you know drinking his Kool-Aid talking about yeah you would have taken Tyson out and I'm sitting up there going look I ain't gonna say nothing out loud because I'm like a little punk kid I'll probably get my ass beat but Mitch you got knocked the hell out <laughs> <laughs> what was his eye out at that time his eye, he was wearing those glasses when he walked into the gym and every so often he would go by uh, the locker that was in there he would take them off like this but look around to see if anybody was watching so out the corner of my eye, I can see it, you know, because the man was a, he was a fairly big man. He's like six, seven or six, six, somewhere around there. And he was well over almost 300 pounds, or I, I would say maybe anywhere between 250 and 270. But he was a very, you know, large man. So, but you and I both know Mike would chop him down to size when he got oh. in the ring with him. And it, whether it was in the ring or in the streets, if you were in the street, you were better off being in the ring getting knocked out because in the streets, Mike could do anything to you. But, you know, in that ring, at least there was a referee and there were things that were sanctioned from him not beating the living hell out of you in that way where he would kill you. But in the street, he could take you out no matter what. And I think Mitch forgot about that, <laughs> especially knowing where Tyson came from and how he grew up. I think Mitch forgot about that. Had Tyson already left at that point? Tyson had already left the gym at that point. He was already, um, he had already been through with Customata and all of that. So I had just missed Mike when I got to Gleason's gym with Johnny Rods. Wow. So you got to meet Customato there as, uh, as well, right? Customato, he came in every once in a while. I didn't know um, Customato like that until, of course, years went by and you heard the story on Tyson. So he came in there. And you know, I, I'm you know, I, I was saying hello to the man. I had no idea who he really was. Mm. So I met him, but didn't know the history of Customata. And I think it was only when, unless you were a boxing fan or a boxing historian, or you just knew boxing, that you would know who Customata was, because a lot of people didn't know who he was yeah. until Tyson became famous. It was the same thing with Angelo Dundee, you know, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, um, even, you know, he, you know, when George Foreman came back, he trained Foreman um, and things like that. So you really didn't know these guys until the boxes themselves made them famous. Yeah. yeah and, and if, if Cus hadn't died, Tyson probably would have been heavyweight champ for 15 years. If Tyson, if, if, if Cus would have, le if he would have been a little bit younger yeah. and his health was in good shape, there's no question in my mind. I don't even think Tyson would have lost the Douglas fight. I think he would have beat Douglas and that would have been it. End of story. It would have been iffy with Evander because, you know, Evander was ready. Yeah. And I think Tyson would have been able to train the way he should have trained if he had his head on his shoulder and he would not have gotten knocked out. You know, if he wasn't partying in Japan and doing what he was doing, I think Tyson would have been undefeated. Yeah, Do Dr. Death was there at the ringside, and he told me, or not at ringside, he was at the arena. I don't know if he was at ringside or not, but he told me mm -hmm. when, he, when it was done, he goes, that was a work. And I don't think, I don't think it was a work, but 
it was Tyson was so out of it that, you know, he had been partying. It, it, it just wasn't him. That's what doc was going by was that was not mm -hmm. the same Mike Tyson that he knew before. And doc, doc watched the match live. I mean, you got to remember Tyson got rid of all his people that got him to where he was. Yeah. Thanks to Don King, you know, King knew what he was doing. He got rid of all of them, all the people that customata brought in to, to help Tyson to get them where he was. King talked them into firing him. And yeah, he got rid of him. It's and like they say, you know, you, you don't need a you don't need a jockey unless the horse stumbles. Exactly. You know, exactly. and you, you know, Tyson was fine for a long time, but then by the time he became, got a little adversity, especially with Douglas, he had become a one punch fighter. You know, he yeah. with, with Cuss, he was a different guy. But those totally. those guys are trained didn't do nothing, and they just let him get away because he could knock people out. Right, and you know, it was it was to me it was quite clear after the um fight that he had with uh who was the guy he knocked out in 91 seconds um oh, uh, michael speaks not michael yeah. speaks yeah. right Speaking. after because remember don king was the one that promoted that fight the minute don the minute he knocked him out and everything was good now we're praising tyson if you go back and look don king was right there in the corner of tyson you know cheering him on and doing everything and it was a scene i think sylvester stallone in one of the Rocky movies, I think it was like Rocky Five. He did that with uh, Tommy Morrison, who played Rocky's, you know, I uh, guess next opponent. And they actually told that story in that movie how the minute he won the heavyweight championship, there was the Don King lookalike there to capitalize yeah. on everything. And that's exactly what happened. He capitalized on it. He knew that if he could talk Tyson into firing and everybody and doing what he wanted to do, he could take all of Tyson's money and just, you know, go crazy. You know, I think it was, and if you, I guarantee you somebody on Twitter is going to correct me if I'm wrong, but it was, I think the Foreman Ali fight. Uh, Don King goes down with Foreman, comes back with Ali. <laughs> yes, yes. <Yeah. laughs> it was one of the five, it may have been with Fra Frazier and Manila, but I think it was one of those fights. Yeah, uh, he comes back Don Ali, King goes down with one fighter, comes back, he comes, goes down with the champion, comes back with the champion. It just yeah, happened but, to be a different guy. I remember he had said something, and it's documented in the movie Ali. Uh, that Will Smith played where I guess, you know, cause Ali and Dundee was great friends. He, he really respected Angelo and loved Angelo. You know, there was no, and especially at that time, there was so much racial tension going on. Plus he had joined the nation of Islam. So, you know, right there, that's like, wow. And I think Don King thought that he was in the clear that he could say anything he wanted to Angelo Dundee. And there was a scene in the movie where, Ali said, no, that happened, and I made sure it didn't happen again. I guess um, Angelo said something, and King thought that he was stepping out of line and made a comment to Angelo Dundee, as if to shut up, or what have you. And Ali reached back and said, don't you ever hear me tell, don't you ever hear me hear you talk to Angelo like that. I will knock your face off. Don't you ever do that. And, you know, Don King was like, whoa, he didn't realize what he did, you know, because Ali really respected Angelo yeah. Dundee. And for him to say that and to embarrass Angelo in front of the media and all of that, that was during the um, the thriller in Manila. When he did that, it was like he had no, Ali wanted nothing to do with him anymore at that point. Yeah, Ali had the greatest quote. Uh, he said, we had two champions go down to Manila, two old men came back. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was. I mean, those guys beat each yeah. other half to death, you know, yeah. and, and neither one was the same afterwards. Well, they exactly. were both hospitalized eyes for for weeks after that, right? Yeah, yeah. They they, they literally. I mean, they beat each other almost to death. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and like, Ali Ali was such a good dude. I mean, he 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 believed in. You know, he did not believe in the Vietnam War. He believed in what he yep. his religion, and mm -hmm. and he was right. You know, history says he was right. You know, and, I mean, he really was. And I mean, even we realized after you know, all that mess that happened in Vietnam that we had no business being over there. Yeah. You know, we were butting our nose and it's something that we shouldn't have butt our nose and all those people, those young men and even some, some of the women died over there for no reason. Because at the end of the day, we were there, I believe, to help out North Vietnamese against South and they wind up taking over anyway after we left. Yeah. That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. They wind up we, taking we, must, we mistook it as a war against communism, as war against colonialism is what it was. Exactly. It was tired of being ruled over by people as any people are. And all of that fighting, but yet they still went over there and conquered after we left. And it was like, okay, so all those men and women that died, 
you know, it was like what they died, they died for nothing, you know, yeah. and it's so sad to, to actually hear that, you know, it, it was just, it was one of those things where, wow, it's like we were over there for no reason. We had no business being over there. You know, and what, and, what, what a shame it was that, that Ali had to lose his prime of his career because of his beliefs there. That, that's yeah. made a big shame of it. And you know, Ali that. against Cleveland Smith, I think it was 1966. That, that's the greatest fighter I've ever seen. I mean, ever. I, I don't think Joe Lewis, I, I don't think Foreman at his – nobody could have touched that guy. But he mm -hmm. wasn't the same guy when he came back. You know, he lost, no. he lost the, his, some of his quickness. Mm -hmm. He was still tough, but he – we ha unfortunately, you had to find out he was still tough because he didn't get hit before the he took that time off. Right. And I think also we started to see it when he fought Ernie Chavez, yeah. uh, Leon Spinks, because at that point, you know, they asked Ali, who was the hardest punching man you had ever been in a ring with? And he said, Ernie Chavez. He was like, he stopped. He almost stopped his insides. Every time he took a body shot, he felt it. He was like, he had never been hit that hard before. They said when he was down in a uh, training camp and, and Foreman would be, beat the heavy bag, he'd beat like just a big dent in it. And people, yeah. look, people were looking at it like, oh, my God. <laughs> he said Ali would walk by it and never look at it. Not yep. put it over, nothing. I mean, it was yep. like everybody else like, this guy could knock down a building. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the great He thing was a bad man. You know, if it hadn't been for Ali, Foreman might have been heavyweight champ, undefeated, never been beaten. Yeah. yeah. Because no one was in his way except for, except for Ali. And Ali outsmarted him, you know, the first time we had ever seen the rope -a dope yeah. You know, he, he he knew what he was doing. And Angelo and everybody else thought he was crazy, <laughs> you know, yeah. getting hit like that. But, you know, but now when we look at it and we look at the tape and hear the history behind it and the talks behind it, we're like, he was probably one of the smartest men in boxing. <laughs> oh, he was that. But but he did, he he got hit by, he blocked a lot of those punches with his face. Yes, he, I mean, he did. did. You know, people talk about the rope and dope. You know, that's a bad know, place to block them. People that don't know, people that don't really know, say, "Oh, he's blocking." The rope. No, he wasn't. He blocked those punches with his face. Yeah, good God, and his body. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, you know Devin, we, we've talked about making of a great boxing champion, but making of a great wrestling champion is where we want to hit on you. The information from you, so. You, you were at Johnny Rod. What, what led you to Johnny's place? And, uh, and tell us a little bit about the young Divana that was growing up there. Yeah, and, I was uh, listening to a radio show, uh, 66, 660 AM, uh, The Fan in New York. And I used to listen to it all the time because they had Jody Mack and a guy named Rich Mancuso that used to talk wrestling all the time. And I was, I think I was in junior high at the time. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I was in my first year in high school. And, you know, if you want to call and ask questions, call us. And I did. So I called. And one of the questions I asked was, how do you become a pro wrestler? Because I had never knew. You know, I'm here it is. I'm a small kid from Brooklyn, born in the projects. I never knew anything. And no one around me ever knew. We just saw professional wrestling on TV and thought that that was it, you know. And they, they told me, they said, well, listen, um, just uh, call us after the show. We'll give you the number. Call us back. And we'll tell you how to do all of that. So I called back. And. I spoke to uh, Rich Mancuso and he says, yeah, he goes, there's a guy named Johnny Rods. And I had heard of Johnny because I watched him because I watched wrestling growing up as a kid. So I remember watching Johnny and he goes, yeah, he has a you know school at Gleason's gym and uh, I'm going to go down there because I'm supposed to be meeting down there and meeting some young talent. And he was like, you know, you can come join me if you want. So I was like, all right, great, I'll come. But I was, what, maybe six, 15 years old, wasn't driving, didn't have a license. And my parents sure as hell wasn't taking me to Gleason's gym. <laughs> Your parents so, were two ministers, right? They were, yeah, they were ministers, uh -huh. reverends. And they were just like, hell no. Uh -huh. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> hell no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically, I was like, all right. So I waited until after I graduated from high school and I made the phone call. I Were you an up. athlete in high school? Did you do? Yes, I played football. Um, I was supposed to go to Florida A and M uh, to play on on a scholarship, and I decided not to play for two, a couple of reasons. Number one, I didn't have the passion for football the way I did for pro wrestling, and it always bothered me because I love football. But I could tell you who won the championship, you know, in the NWA or you know, WWE, you know, back in 1940 something, but I couldn't tell you who, you know, stats about anybody in football during that time. I just didn't have that love and passion for it. I love the contact of the sport, but that was about it. And so I said to myself, well, if I take the scholarship, here's what's going to happen. 
I'm going to wind up getting hit and I'm going to wind up getting hurt. I was like, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to waste their time and my time and get my ass beat on that field, you know, and be an embarrassment to myself and to my family. So that was when I decided pro wrestling was the thing for me. What did you play? I'm sorry. What did you play in football? Uh, Defensive end and uh, defensive end. And I did a little bit of uh, linebacker as well. And at that time, at that time, I was smaller and quicker. (laughs) 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 I was able to do some damage. When when did you, uh, when did did you first go to Johnny Rod? Did you go that then? Did you get, how did you get there? Well, you know, here's the thing. Wow. I, I took, um, because at the time I was living in New Rochelle, New York. Uh, I had left Brooklyn and went to New, and was living in New Rochelle, New York. So I had to take, uh, I believe it was what they call the Metro North from New Rochelle into New York City, which was about an hour and a half uh, train ride. Then from there, I had to take another train, one stop, and then take another train, another stop, and then a, another train about two and a half hours into Brooklyn. The whole ride took about three hours to get there. Ooh. And so I would do that for five and a half years. At the time, I was also married with my twin boys, Terrence and Terrell, which you know very well. You guys know very well. Right. Very well. And very well. I was working three jobs. I was working at the post office um, at 10 a.m. Uh, was, I was working at the post office from 2.30 in the morning to 10.30 in the morning. And sometimes I would work overtime uh, to get that extra money coming in. And so what I would do is I would get on the train, do those three hours, get the living crap beat out of me, you know, by the the guys at the school and Johnny Rods, and then three and a half hours back home. And then when that was done, then I would come back home. I would unload trucks at the supermarket, then go home, help put the twins to bed with with my wife at the time. And then I would go uh, to the club and bounce at the club. Now, here's the great thing. The club was right next to the post office. So, I mean, it was like it was like divine intervention, you know? So it was like I would go to the club, you know, everything was good. And then about 233, because remember the, the clubs in New York City closed at four and I had to be to work at 230. So at three o'clock, I would go next door to the post office. I would punch in and the truck didn't get there until about four o'clock. So the clubs would close at about 330. The lights would come on and... We got everybody out. And then all of a sudden I would see the truck pulling in. I'd be like, all right, guys, I need my pay. I got to go. <laughs> I get my pay and go right next door and unload the trucks and be there until about, about noon that, that morning. I did that for five and a half years. Wow. Oh, my God. Did that we've, all, we, we've all heard about, you know, different territories, how they break guys in. Was Johnny one of these physical guys or was he more yes. one of the a teacher? No, type Johnny type was type. very physical. He would get in the ring with you. He was kind of like Stu Hart in a sense. He would show you, that he would only show you one time. He would show you, you know, different maneuvers and things like that in the ring, different holds. And he would say, okay, next time you get in the ring with me, if I put you in that hole, you got to get out of it and remember how I taught you how to get out of it. And if you didn't, you were screwed. You know, he would be like Stu Hart. He would wrench it in and you'd scream it and there's nothing you could do about it. You're in a boxing gym, you know? <laughs> so you hear all the freaking, you know, boxes going at it and this and that. So nobody heard my screams. <laughs> <laughs> nobody heard me yelling. And it was like, it was one of the best learning experience that I think I'd ever went through because it helped me to become, um, you know, not, not some little punk kid, but, a, you know, a kid that was able to take the beatings and still go, you know? And I'm, I'm so grateful to this day for Johnny for doing that to me. A lot of people go, oh, I, you know, that trainer beat me up and this and that. Look, stop being a little wuss. He, he, as far as I'm concerned, he got me where I needed to be because who was to ever think that how many years later I'd be in the ring with Ron and John? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I got, I got something. Uh, uh, Tommy Dreamer was a guest on our show. Tommy said he got out of Johnny's uh, school in a year. It took you five and a half years. Come took on, me five. Right? Yeah, it took me five and a half years. <laughs> it was, it was one of those things where, because you know, I was barely when I got to wrestling school, I was barely two hundred pounds. I mean, I used to try to eat McDonald's just to gain weight because everybody else was so much bigger than me. And I, and I didn't have anybody to guide me into the gym or to show me how to do things like that and how to, how to put on the proper weight. But I tried everything possible to do it. So, you know, it was kind of a struggle for me to be able 
to try to even get a tryout or anything like that. And at the time, you know, he was like, I can get you a tryout. Yeah, I can get you. A, and he never did because he was like, you're not ready. I remember the first time I asked him, I said, is there any way you can talk to uh, to, to Gurria, Tony Gurria or Chief J Strombo and try to get me, you know, as enhancement talent? He goes, he, the first time he said, he goes, for what? He was like, you know what they're going to do to you? They're going to kill you. <laughs> he was like, you're not ready. You're not ready for that. And he was absolutely right. When I look back and I think about where my head was back then, I would have been destroyed absolutely destroyed mentally i would have been crushed because i wasn't ready to take on that type of atmosphere at that point in time i was still a young kid fresh out of high school refuse i didn't go to college because i think i couldn't take the scholarship i didn't take the scholarship so they said either you know you go to college and take the scholarship and play or we don't give you the scholarship and you know i never took it so i never knew i wasn't ready or prepared for wwe especially all the going on that went on during that time you know and plus the stories i hear now about during that time when i was going to break in i would have been i would have been destroyed i mean just you just, know it, it overwhelmed a lot of people you know especially back then i don't know how it is now i have no idea how it is now because you know i'm just there coming there just sporadically but back then it overwhelmed a lot of people you know you, you come from a small territory and all of a sudden you see this big show with 18 18 wheeler trucks yeah, and all this stuff that's there, a lot of people just got lost. I mean, they just got overwhelmed and got swallowed up by the machine. Yeah, and I mean, there was no way. So Johnny protected me. You know, he yeah. took care of me. He was like, no. And he would lead me on every once in a while. He's like, yeah, I'll call Gabriel. Yeah, I'll call Strongbow. And I'll tell him this and that, but he never did. And I remember we talk about it to this day. And I'm like, thank you. Because even though in my mind, I thought I was ready to go, mentally, I was not. And physically, I definitely wasn't. I mean, I'm barely 200 pounds. Listen, when you got guys, you know, the size of monsters in that ring, I can only imagine what would have happened. And, you know, watching like Jeff and Matt Hardy, watching them in the WWE in the early days and how skinny they were and how they just got ragdolled. I was like, oh, my God, I probably got beat up 10 times worse, <laughs> you know. But, you know, again, everything happens for a reason. And I was having some personal problems. Uh, with my marriage at the time and I literally walked away from wrestling I was like no because nobody believed in the dream that I had you know I, I was like no I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it everybody was like no you're living in a fantasy world you know you need to stay in the post office it's a good job you know benefits and all that it's a government job just stay there and I just knew that that wasn't for me and <clears throat> again I was going through these personal problems I just remember holding my two boys in my arms, rocking them to bed. And they kept looking, you know, they were looking at me with these little beady eyes and their little pacifiers in their mouth. And I said, you know what? I said, I'm going back to wrestling and I'm going to make something of myself. And I'm going to make sure that you are damn proud that I'm your father. Because the, the preacher, John, who we always talk about as my dad, he was my stepfather. So he came in later, but my biological father, you know, he sold drugs. He did things like that. He was living that type of lifestyle. He was never there. My grandmother raised me. She was the fist of the family. She was the one that kept everybody together. And so, you know, here it is. I'm sitting there going, I'm going to make them proud of me and I'm going to make sure. So I'm going to go back to rest. I'm going to bust my behind. I'm going to do whatever I have to do in order to make it. And sure enough, I went back and I'm in the ring doing all of this stuff. Johnny comes out of his office. He goes, wait a minute. I had to come out to see who this was. He was like, good God. He was like, where did all of this come from? I remember telling Johnny, I was like, Johnny, I'm just ready. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. And that was when, I think it was about three months later, he came to me and said, listen, we have this, you know, I trained Tommy Dreamer and Taz and uh, Big Dick Dudley. And uh, all that. I was like, yeah, I know that. He goes, yeah, you know, they're in ECW. <laughs> I went, okay, now remind you, a bouncer at a club, ECW would come on at 12 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. So I'm used to WWF, I'm used to WCW, NWA wrestling. I'm not used to the ECW with barbed wire bats and all of that shit. So I'm sitting up there going in the club, I'm like, what the hell is this? Yeah. And then I saw Ron, you know, because Ron made a couple of appearances in ECW. So yeah. I was like, okay, this can't be that bad. <laughs> if Ron Simmons is there. And sure enough, Ron was doing the same damn thing. He was swinging those chairs and doing everything. I said, what the hell? 
So when Johnny asked me, he goes, what do you think about going to ECW? And you know how you can have a conversation in your mind, like a 20 minute conversation, but yet it only takes three seconds for it to come out. I'm sitting up there going, ain't no way in hell. I want to go to ECW. These people are crazy. That's not wrestling. That's fucking, that's barbaric. And Ron cut some of the best promos in ECW history. Yeah, he did. Oh yeah, my he did. goodness. Yes, he did. You do him now. He'd be canceled so much. Oh, forget about it. The one he I mean, cut was Scorpio. It was, it was so good. I mean, any, a lot of the stuff we did back in ECW, you could not do now. Oh, yeah. You forget you could, about you, it. Yeah. Forget they, can, it. they can retroactively cancel you. For exactly. All, all, all that happened back then. <laughs> exactly. Well, I just remember I just remember going, okay, I'll do it. But in my mind, I'm scared to death. I don't want to go to ECW, you know, because I, I want WWF. I want what I grew up on. I want WCW. I want NWA. That's the style of wrestling that I want. But I knew that if I didn't go somewhere, that WWE would never look at me or I would never get a chance. So I said, okay, first thing I learned how to do, swing a chair. <laughs> <laughs> and so that so was you're, my- the, you're the reason that all the mail got lost in the 90s, right? Yes. Because, I, I mean, tell you, I want to tell you something. I've been listening to your <laughs> schedule. You, you had to drive all the way down to Johnny Rogers, three hours, three and a half hours each way at seven hours. You trained for probably two or three hours. That's 10 hours. Then yeah. you had to bounce till about 2.30. Then you went to work at the post office. You cannot tell me that you were not asleep at the post office on your shift. You can't Listen, tell me that. You know those little cubby, you know those little, it's not a mailbox, but it's like a storage they put the mail in. Yeah. It was, it was, it was, I was so tired one day that I took the mail, threw it down the sewer, and went and saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. And to this day, until they see this interview, I'm, I'll probably get arrested after this. <laughs> I should have taken that to my grave because, you know, getting rid of the mail is a government offense. That's a felony. <laughs> so, so that's that's where Steinfeld's Newman got all those uh, mailman tricks from, from yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And I remember just not wanting to do anything and, and went to sleep in one of the things. <laughs> I remember a, a cop came over and said, excuse me, what are you doing? Like he thought I was like trying to rob the that that little mailbox thing and i was like no i work for the post office here's my id and this and that he goes why are you inside i was like well the mail got stuck he was like this is not a mailbox this is where they put the mail into it so when they get there they can take whatever and then go deliver it to the houses so you want to try again i just said okay i'm hiding from my boss (laughs) i don't want to deliver the mail he goes i can believe that he's like okay (laughs) <laughs> and laughed about it and basically told me to get out of here and go deliver the mail. But other than that, <laughs> half of the mail that I had to sort of deliver, I threw it down the sewer. <laughs> when, when I was in Japan with, with uh, Bob Orton, he really took care of me. And, and Bob, I asked him one day, because they're, they're beating me with chairs and beating me with everything. And I, I never, never, I didn't know how to use one anything. I said, Bob, ha-, I said, how do you use a chair? And he goes, pick it up, kid. And I picked it up he goes, now swing it like Babe Ruth. <laughs> I said, that's all you do? And he goes, yeah. Later, uh, when I went to the, my match, Bob told James Beard, he goes, you know what? I don't normally watch these matches. I think I'm going to watch this one. <laughs> <laughs> I came back. He goes, I think you overdid it, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I that's the to- thing that, you know, that people are so shocked about when they say, how do you work those chairs? You right. don't. You don't. No, you <laughs> really don't. <laughs> Because poor, there was a uh, little Guido and a guy named J.T. Smith. Uh, Paulie said to me, he goes, he goes, Devon, you're going to take the chair and you're going to hit him. I said, Paulie, I've never swung a chair before. I don't want to hurt these guys. And he goes, Devon, if you don't swing this chair and do some justice, these fans will shit all over you. And I will not, I will not be able to use you for the next six months, almost a year. So you got to swing that chair. And I just went, okay, I got to swing it. <laughs> and he said, trust me. They're okay with it. They know what they have to go through. Just swing it, hit him in the top of the head. Now, again, you know this, John. They tell you to hit him in the top of the head. Chances are, when you swing it like Babe Ruth, you don't know if it's going to land on the top of the head. You really yeah. pray, you know? And poor J.T. Smith, I gave him a concussion like you wouldn't believe. Little Guido still talks about it today. He goes, Devon, you know, he goes, I could have you arrested for what you did to me at the ECW. <laughs> I said, well, you know, there is a two-year limit. You cannot do that. <laughs> so, you know, but it, it was one of those things where I went in there and swung that chair and the rest was history. And me and Bubba actually wound up being a team. But Bubba and I 
at first were against each other, you know, because he was doing the stuttering and the dancing and all of that. And, you know, he was trying to get the, the crowd's approval where I came in. I was like, no, screw the crowd. Let's be serious. Let's do this. This was the story that was presented. <clears throat> and so they, they, they liked to, they told the story that it was because of Devon when he came in, he, he made the Dudleys tough and, and this and that. And that's where we took off. And it was one of those things where we were feuding with each other first and we were beating the hell out of each other. It was one of those things where we were swinging chairs, we were swinging barbed wire bats, anything that would get us over. And we were doing it. But remind you, we were young and dumb too. We had all the energy in the world. So we didn't realize the after effects that this stuff would have beating the hell out of each other like this, you know, because when you're young, you don't think anything. You think you're invincible. You think, oh, and you don't care. Happen? Yeah, you, you don't, don't care. care. And we're going out there beating the holy hell out of each other. I must have bust Bubba, Bubba open about maybe six or seven times in the back of the head. He's got a little railroad track going on in the back of his head from all the stitches he got. And I remember one night he goes, Devon, please don't bust me open again. And I went, no, it's cool. I, I know how to do it this time. Sure enough. <laughs> sure enough. Neither, neither. Yeah. And sure enough, I busted him open again. <laughs> and Paulie had to stop me from hitting him with chairs because Bubba was getting to the point. He was like, uh, he was like, F this, uh, you know, I, I can't do this no more. I'm having I, I'm seeing I'm seeing uh, uh, spots in my head because of Devon. <laughs> oh, it was great. And, you know, uh, we're all gonna be we're all gonna be hunting Easter eggs we just hid soon because of that. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh god. You yeah. know, back then though, you got hit with a you got hit with a chair. I remember one time I got hit with a chair in San Diego. I, I think Bob Holly's the one that hit you with it. And just I mean, he hit me as hard oh, as Oh god, and Bob hit you with a good Oh, god. I was like six eight before he hit me. And uh, now, <laughs> yeah. and I'm driving back to the hotel and I thought, man, I I've, I've had too much to drink. And I shouldn't be driving. And I thought, no, oh, I haven't, I haven't had anything to drink. <laughs> Literally, that was in my head. I go, oh, it was just a chair shot. No big deal. And if he hit you hard realized, if you didn't. He hit you hard if you didn't have anything to drink. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I corrected that when I got the hotel, of course. But you know, but you, you think I thought, oh, no big deal. I just got hit with the chair. You know, and you see guys staggering around it, and we'd laugh at them. We like point at them and laugh at them. And, you know, we didn't realize that that concussions might be a bad thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and back then you were looked upon as a wuss if you even can remotely complain about having a concussion. Oh, you like get in the ring, you do this, you do that. Nowadays, you can't do that at all. If there, if there is even a slight glimmer of you not seeing straight or seeing spots and anything like that, you are done. They pull you right out and but you have to go get evaluated. Before you I was going to get hit by a chair with Killer Tim Brooks one time. That was like the first time in Black Bart sitting there with his glasses down. The span. He goes, you know, kid, we don't put our hands up in Texas. And that was all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody did. It was a, it was a, yeah. you know, it was a, one of those tough guy things. You didn't put your yeah. hands up, didn't take him. You just I got hit. We, we used to watch the monitor in the back you know, with ECW and some of the guys that came in, uh, Steve Carino or what have you, they would put their hands up and they were, oh, that's, you know, Taz would be the first one. Oh, that's bullshit, man. What the hell he put his hands up for? You got to be a man. You got to take it. And now when you look at some of these, you know, PTSD with all these concussions and all of that, I'm like, man, Taz, shut the hell up and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so there, there were more Dudleys than Von Erichs, right? Yeah, yeah, there was. There was about not. There was like ten of us, and me and Bubba <laughs> were the ones that stood out. Oh God, there was Snot Dudley. There was Dudley Dudley. There Wait was, a minute, there was Snot Dudley. It was Snot Dudley. I love that name. <laughs> and then there was a, then there was Dudley Dudley. Then there was um, Dancing with Dudleys. Then there was Big Dick Dudley. Um, of course, myself. Bubba, Spike, Sign Guy Dudley, Chubby Dudley, and <laughs> Bubba, Bubba was chubby. <laughs> That's just not nice. Uh, he'll kill me for that. <laughs> I talk about chair shot, he'll give me. <laughs> you know, he's gonna do a segment on you on that busted open radio. <laughs> no, well, you gotta be fair. J Jerry has hope he doesn't mind me saying that Jerry has COVID right now, so he's excused from saying anything that you want to say because he's he's very he, he is very sick, and that's true. And he but he came on this because it was you, Devin. 
So oh, well, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate that so much. And you know, one of the things I've always said was Jerry was there during the whole Reverend Devon um, thing. And I remember separating from Bubba because Bubba and I had been together for almost 12 years at that point. And now Vince decides that he wants to break us up and put us on our own, which I was okay with. But at the same token, I was scared, you know, because I had never been out of a tag team and then doing things on my own. Plus, <clears throat> I'm in this big pond as a little fish now starting all over. And I remember my decision making in terms of putting matches together and things like that. I was very unsure of myself. And Jerry realized that. And I remember Jerry used to help me every time. And it was almost like you had my matches yeah. every single time that, you know, I would show up at the arena and I knew it. And I wouldn't make a move. Just like Rock wouldn't make a move without Patterson. I wouldn't make a move without Jerry. You know, I would go to Jerry, you know, is this okay? Is that okay? And sometimes Jerry would go, no, let's not do that. Let's do this, this, this. And, you know, it worked great. And there were times where I was so frustrated with it, with the gimmick, because everybody else was saying everything was good. You know, the fire was there, everything. And I remember even pulling Ron aside and asking Ron, Ron was like, you know, Devin, I think you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing. And we don't, I don't get what the hell's going on. And I remember Arn Anderson basically would pull me to the side and goes, D, he goes, Devon, you just do what you do and don't worry about it. Maybe something, you know, something will come around. I'm not understanding why, you know, this is happening to you. It was just, I always wanted to thank you firsthand. I was going through so much drama back then during that, but yet you and Ron were basically the ones that kept me from going postal. <laughs> <laughs> because it just didn't make any sense to me if my peers who have done things in this business and that has all the knowledge in the world is basically telling me I'm doing good and keep up the good work. There's nothing in that ring that I would have changed. You just keep doing what you're doing. If they're telling me that, then why isn't it working its way up the chain, you know, to the powers that be? But it happens. Things happen yeah. for a reason. And I don't sit there and dwell on it. It's like, okay, whatever. But you know something? Like John said in the very beginning, one half of the greatest tag team in the history of this business, we've been recognized as that. And, you know, I'm very grateful, you know, to God and, and everybody that I've worked with and things like that, that helped me get to that position in my career where I will always be remembered you know, as, you know, one of the tag team greats, which is great. You know, did I want to do singles? Absolutely. I had a little bit of a singles run in TNA and I did very, very well over there. Um, but I really wanted to do it here in WWE to prove that that Reverend Devon gimmick wasn't, you know, a mistake, that it would have worked yeah. if given the ball in the rocket. And again, to have you, Ron, Rikishi, and, and everybody else tell me that I was doing good, and then for it not to register up to the, you know, to the guys up above, it was like, okay. And then the fans, you know, even to this day on my social media, if I put it up on social media, they were like, man, we love that gimmick. What happened? I wish it would have gone further. And I would just type in, yeah, we did. I do too. <laughs> I wish you would have done further. What you, what'd you ever do with all the money that you collected in the collection plate when you passed it around? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, um, and, he and I split it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, him and I, you, Mr. Briscoe, you and I took 5% of that money because yeah. John and Ron was waiting in gorilla. <laughs> they were waiting yeah. there every They're night waiting, there, from the collection uh, plate. That's correct. Yeah. Devin, where are you tonight? Yeah. I'm at the hotel. Why? We're going out tonight drinking, aren't we? I was like, damn it. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> that money came in handy. Yeah, it did. <laughs> well, see, Devon, the thing about that, you know, they're guys that, you know, they they say they, they get a gimmick and they, they think they, they know everything. And uh and but you were always searching for knowledge. And that's that's the reason I, I enjoyed working with you guys so much. Both you and Bubba both you guys were were sponges. You know, you you come in and you know, you're, we're not doing something right in this tag team. You know, my brother and I were successful tag team. So you come to me and ask. And, but I, I enjoyed working with guys that wanted the knowledge. And you were one of the guys that always was searching for knowledge, especially when you got you got stuck with the Reverend Devon, which I agree. That, that was a great gimmick for you. And I you, loved it. You certainly had the background for, uh, for it. And, uh, and it, uh, to me, it, it could have worked. But there was such a big fish pond at that time too, you know? I yeah. mean, well, one of the things I also remember was, you know, I worked with Triple H and, you know, during that time, if Hunter didn't believe in you, 
he wasn't going to work with you, let alone lay down for you. Not only did he work with me, but he laid down for me, you know, and, you know, between that and then, you know, and then other people, you know, coming to me going, man, you're getting the raw end of the deal on this. You know, I wish you, I wish they would do something and pull it and pull a thing with this. I was coming from the gym. I, I'm going to say it was probably WrestleMania 20. I could be wrong. I'm not sure, but we were at Madison Square Garden and I remember um, it was a big deal and The Rock was there. We were both leaving the gym early and he was like, hey, come with me. I got a car service. We'll take you back to the hotel with me. So we were talking in the car and he said that he had went to Vince and or went to went to Vince or somebody within the company that was higher up and said, listen, I would like to work with Devon. You know, I like the gimmick and I think this would work. And they told him I wasn't ready. Uh, it's a shame. They told it's him a, I wasn't a bit ready. Of a rip off of, uh, and I say a rip off, you know, everything's a bit of a rip off of something. Uh, the Samuel right. Jackson character, right? From Pulp Fiction. Yes. Yes. Samuel L. Jackson. Which is uh, a, it's one of the greatest characters of all time. Yes. And I was, uh, you know, I love that character because again, it was something that <clears throat> I knew because of my my background, with both of my parents being reverends, me living in church night and day. What did they think about you passing the collection plate you with your as a crooked ass minister? Well, when they saw the video, I made sure that part was cut. <laughs> <laughs> so they never saw it. But then I would my 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 comeback was, well, dad don't we pass the collection plate a couple of times in, in the church? But I, wasn't I, 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 I want to throw something out there too. I mean, yeah, you say Ron and John, usually they were following you. So usually they just took that money and threw it to the crowd when they were walking out there. And they pocketed a little beer money, but uh, you know, for the fans <laughs> out there, we didn't keep all the collection money. We, we tried to just- Oh, it. would you stop? <laughs> I'm trying to make baby faces out of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you, know, know. you know, Devin, it's a good thing you told Mr. Briscoe thank you because he does have COVID, and if he happens to not, not make it through the telecast here, you got to tell him before he, he passed away. <laughs> and and, and, and by the way, John wants, me to die. John wants me to die on this podcast here. With you, well, if I do, I'm in good hands. You can uh, deliver me. That's right. You got a reverend so. here. <laughs> he, he told me before the before the podcast, he goes, you know, I may die during this pot during the pot. He may he said I may die, and I said. We'll do it during the podcast. <laughs> well, at least I'm not the only one because I was driving doing it thinking I was going to have it. And you were like, well, just get into an accident. It'd oh, yeah, great. it would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, fill in the gap for us, Devon. How, uh, the, the time between ECW and, and WWE, uh, how was that jump made? Well, we basically, uh, Blackjack Brown, if you remember Blackjack Brown, it was a photographer that at ringside. Right. He was good friends with Vince Russo and Blackjack would come around all the time. And Russo was a very big fan of ECW. He would watch the show, excuse me, and all of that. And somehow or another, I guess the phone call was made between those two. And Russo was like, I would love to bring the Dudleys in. And I just remember, you know, um, getting the phone call at the ECW dojo from Blackjack. Bubba was there. He spoke to him. And when Bubba hung up, he was like, I think we might be going to WWE. At the time, WWF. And I went, what are you talking about? He was like, that was Blackjack Brown. And at the time, I didn't know who he was. And he said, Russo wants to talk to us. And I thought it was like a rib or it would never happen. And then I guess the conversation happened again between those two. And then Bubba got involved with it, speaking with him. And that was when Bubba you know, brought me in on the conversation. And the rest was history. At that point in time, we had the meeting um, at Titan Towers. We met with Vince, JR, Vince Russo, and who was the other guy during that time? Um, God, he, I can't remember the gentleman's name. Uh, he was with Vince Russo at the time, Ed Farrar. Ed Farrar, yeah. Ed Farrar, he was there at the time. So we all met at the same, you know, at the time and you know Vince was wound up being like 20 minutes late you know so that's like normal Vince it's just in the meeting that's early that's early that's early yeah. because we had the way he normally does yeah and so we sat there and had a great conversation with him and oh and JR was there as well and basically they basically you know pretty much said we would love to bring you guys in we think you'd be a perfect fit for the roster and so forth and so on and I was like all right well you know I'm ready to I'm ready to do it and so we go home 
And then a week later, I get a phone call <laughs> from one of the referees. And he says, Devon, is it true that you guys may be going to WWF? And I said, how did you hear that? He goes, is it true? I go, well, yeah, there's a possibility. Why? He goes, I think you might want to see this tape. And I said, what tape? Uh -oh, <laughs> he showed I know me where you're going. <laughs> the, yeah, he showed me the video of Public Enemy and APA. I saw that. I went, Bubba, there's no reason for us to go to WWE. <laughs> there's no reason for us to go. <laughs> I went, hell no. I go, I, I don't think this is good. And Bubba goes, Devon, we're going to be fine. What's the chances of WWF putting us in the ring with the APA that soon? And sure enough, <laughs> as soon as we got there. About 100%. The heck, about 100%. As soon as we got there, what are we doing? We're laying the acolytes out with, with two, by two, two by fours. I went, what the hell? I'm walking in and going, you think we can call Paul Heyman and get our jobs back? <laughs> The best part was we we got no offense that day. You know, yeah. you, it was it was all you guys, and we, yeah. and we told you, you know, guys, you lay us out. We don't. We're not going to bitch, complain. And that's when <laughs> Bubba had the two by four, and he's looking at it, and and Ron goes, "You do know how to work a two by four, right? Right. <laughs> yeah." So wait a minute. So that happens, and then he, he goes, "Yes, sir, Mister Simmons. Yes, we got it. Yes, we do." He walks out. You guys walk out the room. He goes, "Devon, you're hitting Ron." I go, "What the hell?" <laughs> yeah. I go, "Why?" <laughs> Bubba hit me so hard right on the spine. I thought he paralyzed me. I'm not Good kidding. God. My hands and feet went went to tingling and asleep right away. That's how hard he hit me. And he hit me so hard. I'm like, he just crippled me. <laughs> you gotta be kidding. <laughs> oh, but you guys got us back the next week. Well, I, and I and I saw Bubba's, I saw Bubba on the show and he told the version of the story, but he didn't tell the, the legit story because I remember the locker room clearing out and you guys were there. And I, I think it was a Michael, I think it was Michael Cole. He was in the middle. I was on one side, Bubba was on the other. Bubba's doing his stuttering gimmick. Now I have to do the commandments. Thou shall not steal. And I can see you and Ron just waiting to charge and the snot and the, the, the fumes coming out of your nose. And I can see you coming out of your nose and then Ron's just like, I'm gonna whoop their ass. <laughs> and I'm just like, and like, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> and then I remember I hesitated on thou shalt not mess with the Dudleys, which is the last thing you guys run in. And I went, thou <laughs> shalt not. And Bubba hit me, like you can't see, but Bubba hit me on, on the hands, like, Dion. And I went, Mess with the Dudleys? <laughs> it was like two freight trains coming in and just beat the hell out of us. Well, we had waited a week. You yeah. know, you guys and you guys beat the I mean beat the living hell out of us. And we had waited a week. And now the whole freaking dress room comes out. You know, not that we needed an audience, but it really <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, all I had to do was watch the tape. <laughs> and oh, but as, you know, the best part was as soon as it was done, you guys got up and go, Thanks, guys. We, thank, we, you. Yep. thank you. And we went out and had drinks and we're best had friends ever everything. since. I mean, it was really good. And then hold on. Then the next week, see, this is the story that Bubba forgot to tell. The next week, you and Bubba had a singles match. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Been tearing off on each other, punching each other in the face. And I'm like, would y'all stop that shit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and then after that, we started drinking some more. It was great. I mean, we had a great time with you guys. And, you know, we created so much history. And it was, the thing about it with, with you and Ron was I learned so much, you know, and it not only how to be a wrestler, but to be an a, a human being in the wrestling business. I mean, regardless of what I've learned from Johnny, and all of that it's one that's one thing but to actually be in a company where you've got veterans that have done things and in, in that in that company and that was continuing to do things to learn from that learning tree was incredible and i can't thank you and ron enough for everything that you guys did even the ass whippings it was great <laughs> you know we, we loved you guys i mean we, for, for the moment we met you we liked you you know and yeah, then when you guys beat us up it's like I think we like those guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me do you remember the story where we're going over the match? We're at the Trump Plaza, and it's the first time we had been back in like, I don't know, since WrestleMania five. And we're in the back going over the match. Now we talked about 
a false tag. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. we talked about it, but I wasn't there to hear that the false tag had been canceled, yeah. so had been dropped. So we're in the back, and the music hit, we go out. So we're in the ring, we're having a match, everything is great. So I'm getting heat on Ron. I'm sorry, I'm getting heat on John. And we're going to go that, going that. Now, all of a sudden, we double down. Now, I think this is the false tag. So I'm crawling and crawling, and I'm looking at Bub. I'm like, now, wait, Bubba. wait, Devon, you got to set up. We were sold out, and we sold had out. the crowd. We had yep. the crowd right where we wanted them. Had them. And I mean, they would cheer. I mean, they were loving it. All of a sudden, Bubba comes in. Now, I'm thinking that when Bubba came in and Earl goes to Bubba, I'm thinking, okay, false tag. But it was just Bubba being Bubba. He just came into the ring. And all of a sudden, there's the tag being made. <laughs> As that happened, Ron comes in. I get up off the ground, and I see him coming after me. So I take Earl, and I put him in front of me. Yeah. And I'm going like this. And Ron is just like, God damn it, Devon, it's the hot tag. I just went, <laughs> I just went oh, God. I, I picked up Earl. I said, stay right here. Don't move. <laughs> And Ron beat the shit out of me. <laughs> it was but so it was, funny. It was the way he did it. Because Ron, is, he's trying to hit me. And every every way he went, I take Earl and I'm putting him in the way so he won't, so Ron won't hit me. And finally, Ron just went, damn it, Devon, it's the hot tag. <laughs> I just went, oh, God, he's going to kill me. <laughs> and you moved, you moved Earl aside and you just started feeding for the <laughs> feed yeah. like Oh God. I was like a little kid learning how to walk. I was like, I did not want to, I was getting my ass whooped. I did not want to go forward. Oh, it was great. And Brad, so we get to the back and Bradshaw goes, two WrestleManias, two sold out, made history, and Devon killed it in one night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had, you know, we had a million matches. We had so many yeah, we matches. Did. We did the barroom brawls. We we did we yep. were all around the loops. We had a long history together. Absolutely. And again, so many of those matches were so good. You know, it's like sometimes I go on YouTube and I look for them, and sometimes I can't find them because you have to put in the right wording and everything to get the actual match that you're looking for. And sometimes it just pops up when you're looking at those things that might relate to what you're looking for. And that's how I watch a lot of the stuff. And it's amazing the stuff that we had done over those years. And it's just like, it's incredible, man. I, I really enjoyed myself. And I regret, I regret cold heartedly. People, you know, the, the old time is telling me, don't blink kid, because when you do, it's over. Sure enough, I blinked and it's over. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, and the, and the thing about it was we had such good chemistry with you guys. And we, yes. for one, we liked you guys, but we had such mm -hmm. good chemistry. We never discussed anything in the back. No, we didn't, and that's the thing. And that's where a lot of today's wrestlers run into problem because they discuss it in the back, and then if you go out there and something goes wrong, they don't know how to call an audible. Yeah. They don't know how to change things up and to make it work. And that's the sad part with today's wrestling because everything is so scripted. They have to do everything by the book and what is being said in the back and if you go off script forget about it yeah you know we had we had steve kern on here he was a great teacher and steve said it was it's it's about movement not emotion now and with a exactly. lot of there's a few there's a few that really get it but you know for mm -hmm. the most part he's talking about but I, that was a unique way to put it and i think that's right you know sometimes yeah. they just want to fill time with movement mm -hmm. instead of emotion and what we wanted to concentrate on with you guys was emotion Right. And we got a lot of that out there. I mean, it really was. It was such a great time with you and with you and Ron. And again, the learning tree, you know, especially with somebody like Ron, you know, who had been. Oh, yeah. yeah. What he'd been through and what he had done in the business before he even got to us, you know, yeah. and got to you. I mean, it was just oh, like, yeah. it was incredible, you know. So to actually be looking across the ring and seeing you two and especially seeing Ron, it's like, wow. You know, and they asked me, said, would you mind tagging with Ron? I go, why are you even asking me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, 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 you really are asking me, do I want to tag with the first black heavyweight champion in the history of the world? Exactly. exactly. Ask him, because if he says yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm on board. <laughs> yep. you, you were a student of the game, Devon. So was, was Ron one of your, one of your role uh, uh, models when, uh, when you're coming yes. up? 
Yes, he was. I mean, he was definitely one of my role models, especially the, the night that he won the title. And I remember the joy and the excitement, not only that came over me, but just watching him react to winning, you know, the, the heavyweight championship. It was just, I remember watching it over and over again, saying to myself, that could be me. Because again, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up in the projects. And, you know, I didn't know anything. There was no athletes around me. So I think the only ones that I saw on TV, those were the athletes that I ever knew. You know, I never knew anybody that actually accomplished or did what Ron did. And again, growing up where I grew up, you didn't do that. You know, you didn't, you didn't have that around you. There was no positivity, nothing around you. So to me, watching wrestling was my escape from off the streets and not getting into um the mix with bad people because i was always rushing home trying to watch pro wrestling when i found when i knew it was on tv so watching ron it was like wow that's somebody that looks like me you know that 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 could be familiar with me the whole night and he's heavyweight champion you know so it does touch you believe it or not it does make a difference especially in a young black kid's life that comes from where i came from and now all of a sudden his dreams and aspiration is to become just like the gentleman he sees on TV. I mean, between him, Rocky Johnson and Tony Atlas, especially when they won the tag team titles back in the day, I remember my grandmother and I jumping up off the freaking bed screaming, you know, we were so happy to see that because again, it had, it had only been what, maybe 20 years since the Jim Crow laws and all of that that had taken place, you know, it was like the 60s was was still fresh. You know, we're now in the early 80s, like 81, 82, I think it was 82 when it happened. So it was like almost 20 years that went by and all that stuff that happened back then is now, you know, we're trying to erase it and move on. And with them winning, you know, being the first black tag team champions ever, it was such a huge thing with a lot of black people, even, you know, growing up, my friends, uh, as kids watching that, it was incredible. You know, it really was. So, you know, between Ron, between Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson, forget about it. Forget about you it. Know, it that's why people, you know, Gorillaz, how important it is to break barriers right. and, and mm -hmm. people that break those barriers are people like Ron and, and Jackie Robinson and, and right. you know, guys that, you know, were, were, cause to break a barrier, you can't be equal to the other side. You gotta be better, uh, you know, cause mm -hmm. they hurt people that break them are, are special people, but it right. means a lot to society. It means a lot to our world to see these barriers being broken. That's why I was glad to see, you know, two black women uh, main eventing uh, WrestleMania. WrestleMania, absolutely. I mean, it was why, why it's cool to see, you know, women, main eventing all kinds of different things in everything you know and it's mm -hmm. it's a matter about equality but it's also a matter of those barriers being broken are important exactly and i mean you know it like i said i was so excited i was so happy and then not to mention let's move you know 20 30 years further and you put me and bubba together first real black you know one one guy black other one being white you know put together and now all of a sudden it's not about race you yeah. know, because usually if you see a black guy and a white guy together, it's all the black guy and the white guy. But with yeah. me and Bubba, it was the Dudleys, you know, yeah. and the story that was being told was that we were brothers from different mothers and, you know, same father, but different mothers. And that story <clears throat> carried throughout our whole career where people still to this day ask me, are you and Bubba really brothers? And at first, I want to go, you dumb son of a bitch. <laughs> but we had some I, guy one time, me and Ron stopped, you got gas somewhere in Jersey or somewhere, and some guy goes, I know you two guys, you're the twins. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron just looked at Ron goes, we're who? <laughs> I can see Ron's expression, too, when he's like, we the who? The what? <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's unique because me and Ron are the same way. We, we it was it's cool that you put because you know wrestling back in the say sixties, seventies, and eighties, it was all groups were with groups. You know, right. Mexicans were the Mexicans, Europeans were the Europeans. You know, cowboys, mm -hmm. cowboys, natives, natives. You know, now you yep. did have you know Jerry and, and Thunderbolt. Uh, you know, were a team. Right. And Owen and and uh, Coco, and Coco were a team. Yep. But, you know, we're, we're we're one of certainly one of the first. And, right. And it, and it was never made a big deal out of it. And I thought that's what made it even more special because mm -hmm. if you made a big deal out of it, then it becomes 
contrived. But, right. And the thing about it was like nobody cared, you know, and we were That's at right. that point. Nobody stage, cared. Nobody cared. We were at that point in stage in the game where, again, they didn't say, oh, that black guy and that white guy. It was Ron and John, the APA, yeah. the Acolytes. It was Devon and Bubba, the Dudley boys. It was never that white guy or that black guy. It was just we were a team. You for once made people forget the racial right. Thing in terms of black and white, which is what we always strive to do. We never tried to make it a black or white thing. You know, it was always we were together as a unit. We were we were brothers, you know, from different mothers, and we were gonna we were gonna preach that and, and carry that on. And that's the way it was, and that's the way it should be. You know, whether it would have been back in the '60s or '70s, but definitely today, because we have come such a long way. And I still feel that sometimes we still have some ways to go with certain things, but we have come a long way since, again, the Jim Crow laws and things like that from the 50s and the 60s. We've come such a long way. Yeah, you know, when Jim, when Jim Crockett Sr. first put Thunderbolt Patterson and myself together, this was early 70, probably 1970, early 1971. Jim Crockett Sr. called me into the office. He said, Do you have any problem with it? I said, Jim. I, I'm 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 minority myself. I'm Native American. I have no issues with it at all. I, I welcome the fact that Thunderbolt plus he, he was gonna be my mail ticket and I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, by all means, I don't want to be his tag team. So he said, Well, you guys will run into some difficult uh times here. He said, in Carolina, you know, in, in the early seventies was still Jim Crow area there. We we would I told John this story and I've told our audience this story. We were driving like in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Be a big billboard up there. Welcome to KKK country. Here I am with with, with an African American sitting in a black on black El Dorado brand new spanking El Dorado Cadillac, and we're we're tooling through the town, and we can right. see people pointing at us. I, Boat, I guess I know who's getting out to get the beer tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was never any anything on TV that pointed that out. You know it. It was just a natural thing, and for me, it was just, you know, it didn't seem out of the ordinary at all to me, but I would have friends and, and fans bring that up. How, how do you ride with that guy? What do you mean? How he's my brother. You know, that's how right, I'm, exactly. But, and at that know, time, that was fresh. That was like, it was new at that time. Yeah, you know, yeah. when you guys did it, it was really just coming off the cusp of everything that had went on in the 50s and 60s. I remember there was one similar incident that happened with us, with me, <clears throat> but it was with Bull Buchanan. But different scenario. We were dry. We were leaving um, the arena uh, in L.A. in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, what was the arena? Um, the Staples Center. And we were running out of gas. So all of a sudden, we get off the highway because we we have, we're going to LAX to catch our flight out. But we had to fill the rental car up because no one thought of doing that before we got to the building. So we're driving. All of a sudden. Uh, Bull pulls off. He goes, Devon, we got to get gas because if we don't get gas, we're going to be pushing this car to, to Hertz. And I was like, all right, let's get off. So he gets off and all of a sudden the neighborhood just changed. And I remember <laughs> just watching. I go, something wrong here. <laughs> I go, what the hell happened? This is not Los, This is not the Los Angeles that I know. Come to see one of the streets just said Crimshaw Boulevard. <laughs> I went, oh, shit. <laughs> I just went, oh, God. So Bull pulls into the gas station and you got some people sitting outside the gas station, just, you know, they're talking all of a sudden when we pulled up, they just stopped and they just started staring. So Bull goes, listen, I'll pump the gas. Don't worry, I'll pay for this one. I said, Bull, stay your ass in this car. Don't forget <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, that's all I need is for you to talk and say something with that with that accent of yours, that Southern accent. Yeah. And I was like, mm -mm, stay your ass in this car. He goes, Devon, I'm fine. I go, Bull, for the both of us, I'm begging you. <laughs> Stay in the goddamn car. <laughs> Don't get out. <laughs> I'll tell you a great Bull Buchanan story. You know, he had that he had that deep southern, you know, Alabama accent, you know. Yes. And uh, you know, he's one of the best guys in the world. I love Bull. But he goes to New York and he's trying to talk to a cab driver whose English was not his first language. And so he's trying to explain to him in that deep southern accent to take him to Madison Square Garden. He takes him to Madison Square. Which is, which is which is a separate place right. in New York. And the guy tells him to get out. Bull goes, what do you mean? He's got all his wrestling gear. He's waiting, trying to get to the garden. The guy puts him out at Madison great. Square. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, man. The stories that we have that we could tell 
oh my god it, it, the show would be endless it, it's great i mean again I, you know I, I, like the old times would tell me you know don't blink because it's over and it's one of those things where man i really wish i would have listened not that i didn't enjoy myself or didn't you know have the story to tell but god it was so good that i just regret that it's over you yeah know? And, you know i was, you know, I was at wrestlemania I did the pre-show or whatever it was with at uh, this last year and mm -hmm. one of the young guys i can't remember who it was it said something about hey what's your advice and i said memorize the moment yeah so take, take a mental photograph of being out there in front of seventy eight thousand people because as yep. you say when when you blink it's done and i yep. said memorize i said you, you got a lot to memorize. You got a lot to remember about the match. You got a promo and all this stuff. But whatever you do, take time to look around and take a mental photograph of that because that'll stay with you the, the rest of your life. Absolutely. And I remember when Bubba and I came back to WWE, uh, we wrestled the Usos in Dallas at the stadium. And I believe they recorded as 110,000 people. And before we went out there, Bubba said, Devon, when you go out there, just breathe and just take a look. Just take it all in. It was like, because we might not ever see this again, being on the stage like this and performing. He was like, look around, just take a second and just look and feel the, you know, the energy in the building. And it was incredible. It really was. And I did that coming down the aisle. And once I got into the ring, I didn't even realize that the Usos were in the ring and we were going to start the match. I was just taking it all in. I mean, it was just, it was an incredible sight. And it was just an incredible feeling that, again, I wish I could feel for the rest of my life. But, you know, like you said, once it's done, it's done. You know, you know I, I, I remember that day because I was doing uh, the commentary that day. And, I, you know, I started at the Sportatorium there on Katie's and Industrial there, you know, just in South Dallas. And I'm not far from there. And all of a sudden there's 100 plus thousand people, whatever the crowd was there at, at Texas Stadium. And me growing up a Cowboy fan also, I'm in the home of the Dallas Cowboys, you know, and it's right. sold out for wrestling. And I just remember doing the same thing, just looking around going, you got to be kidding me. This is yeah. unbelievable that mm -hmm. I'm allowed to be here and, and witness yep. this. Yep, because I, you know, the first two, two uh, TLC matches, you know, I didn't get to enjoy it because I was so damn nervous. I you guess. Know? Yeah, I mean, you let, think? Table only because only you could have died. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, especially hanging 30 feet up in the air with Jeff Hardy. He just don't know what to expect. <laughs> yeah, which he's not going to get hurt. No, and you know, and I he has at, rubber bones. I just, you know, I had this when I was having a back surgery, I come out of it and I'm thinking about my career. I'm like, how the hell could this have happened? I'm like, wait a minute. I'm in the ring with Jeff Hardy. This man has taken insane bumps. Have I taken insane bumps? Absolutely. But not to the level of Jeff Hardy. Why am I sitting up here in the hospital having back surgery and that son of a bitch is still wrestling yeah. like he's a like he's a freaking newbie? <laughs> no he told me one day, he goes, ever. I'm going to jump off my brother's back, clothesline me in midair. And I said, Jeff, where are you going to land? And he goes, it doesn't matter. Oh, it does. Oh, I, I don't want a homicide on my record. I just, well, <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, John, uh, newsflash, that was a little too late after Public Enemy. <laughs> <laughs> stop it. Hey, stop it. You guys beat him up, too, so don't you even talk to me. Not to the degree where I got a phone call talking about, you think you really want to go to WWF? <laughs> <laughs> hey, remember the time uh, Bubba tripped on the rope in Madison Square Garden? Oh, my oh, God. Uh, that was hilarious. I'll let oh. you tell a story on that one. <laughs> it was so good. We'd worked so long to get heat. Same thing, like we'd done Atlantic City. We get all this heat, and I'm the one standing in the ring, and you hit the hot tag to Bubba. The place just freaking erupts. Yep. I mean, yep. they're going nuts. Bubba comes in and catches his foot on the middle rope and falls <laughs> flat on his face. <laughs> and he doesn't catch himself. He falls flat on his face. <laughs> and I start laughing and he's, his head is like right at my feet. And I go to pick him up. I go, it's all right. I'm about to call a spot. And he's so mad. He double legs me and just starts <laughs> punching me in the head as hard as he can. I'm like, you clumsy bastard. I didn't do it to you. <laughs> and I tell oh, Ron, I go, don't come in. He's mad. <laughs> <laughs> but the great part about it is John, we get to the back and Bubba's all down and out of it. And he goes, Man, oh, he man. was depressed. He was he was, he was done. sad. So Ron, and remember, this is Madison Square Garden. This is where we grew up. And you know, we saw a snooker jumping off the cage on Morocco. 
you know, the whole nine. And you know, all, the history that came out of, all the history that came out of the garden. So he's like the boo-boo face. So Ron comes over and he goes, hey, bub, what's going on? What, what's the matter? It ain't that bad. <laughs> Bubba goes, no, Ron, it is. He goes, you don't, you don't understand, Ron. He goes, my family was there. He was like, my mom and dad was sitting front row. My fraternity brothers were sitting front row. And my fiance was sitting front row. Ron goes, well, yeah, that's 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 bad. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's bad. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the dive from Snooka. Uh, everybody we've had on the show from New York was was in the garden that night were you in the garden that night too no i was watching it on the msg okay. network thank you <laughs> uh, yeah but i wasn't i wasn't there because at that point in time my family did not believe in taking me to wrestling matches <laughs> and it was only until i became a teenager when they took me my first wrestling match was actually in 1987 was when the first time my family actually decided to take me i was such a diehard wrestling fan that they decided to take me which helped me make the decision that i was going to choose wrestling over football and i just remember watching the um the match with snooker and morocco and i was in, in amazement and to see him go off that cage the way he did i was like oh my god i was in awe screaming up and down in my living room because i was such a jimmy fan that i was i was losing my mind and it was just one of those things where it had never been duplicated again you know by anybody no matter how many guys we see coming off the top rope you will never get that feeling that you felt that's right when you saw snooker do it for the first time to morocco yeah. And Madison Square Garden. And that old what? shaky cage. The cage was shaky. Yes. I mean, it was, that was, yep. that was wild. And, and for Snooker to actually have the balance to be able to do that. Remember, there's nothing up top for him to hold on once he gets up there to get his balance and then to do the I love you and then jump. You know, he's basically balancing himself on there. And like you said, it was a shaky cage back then. You know, so for, for him to actually do that, oh my God. You know, incredible. I mean, that was one of, I think that match a lot of the guys who, you know, from our era, basically watching that wanted to become professional wrestlers. You know, they that match inspired a lot of people. You I, know? I, I truly believe that's one of the most iconic uh, moments in, in our in the WWE history, uh, you know, let alone yeah. our wrestling history. Is that Absolutely. Perfect? I mean, rem I remember later on that night about, I think, because I think you got, I think we, uh, the, the company went off the air at like almost 10 30 or something like that i remember watching nbc not yeah nbc watching the news and warner wolf uh the anchorman one the sports guy warner wolf basically had the clipping of that and kept showing it over wow. and over and over again because remember back then pro wrestling was still in the closet right. no a lot of fans and a lot of the the main media didn't want to look at us as being athletes one and number two it was a show so they didn't believe in us so for one or wolf at that time who was one of the the top sports guys in new york city to actually go on the news <clears throat> and show that over and over and over again that was big that was huge because again pro wrestling was in the closet you didn't really tell anybody you were a wrestling fan especially those who weren't wrestling fans who might have watched it for the first time and saw that they weren't admitting it. You know, it was only until, you know, the WrestleMania when when um, Hogan came in and did what he did, the whole Hulkamania running wild, the whole uh, rock and wrestling. That was when it was cool to be a wrestling fan back then. If you weren't a wrestling fan, that was when it was OK to talk about it. You know, people were going on. Um, Johnny Carson talking about it, Jay Leno. They were going on all of those shows talking about, hey, I was just at a wrestling match. It was incredible. And it was like, why, you know, it was like, these are athletes. These are guys that are going in there and putting on a tremendous show. We're athletes, we're human beings, and we know what we're doing. A apparently, we're doing something right if we're capturing your, you know, attention and doing what we're doing in the middle of that ring. And sports guys, they thought it would hurt their credibility if they ever discussed it. Yes. Yep. So and they would, would never, they would never discuss it. You know, they never, never talk about it. Talk about it. They, you know, they just mm -hmm. thought they'd be ridiculed or whatever else. And yep. You know, now, now it's in the mainstream everywhere. You know, you see it on Sports Center. They'll play all kinds of you know wrestling clips and all kinds of different things. Listen, John and Jay, when you know during the Attitude Era, 
when we were going up against Monday Night Football, when we were beating Monday Night Football in the yeah. rating, that was when I knew pro wrestling had finally arrived after all of those years of people that have come before us going in there, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, trying to get this business to where they knew it could be. It finally arrived. And I was so happy about that. I mean, that was when we knew it was here. You know, we were so lucky to be there during the Attitude Era. You know, we yeah, could have been right. in any, any era. You know, we could have been yep. in almost any era there was. We got to be in that era when the ratings were so good. And good forever will be remembered for that era, which is fine, which is fine with me. I'm glad to be remembered at all. But it, exactly. It's so wonderful that we were actually part of that. To, to, it's so cool. Yep. And, you know, and again, you know, one of those things where, you know, it was so cool that people watched wrestling. They actually was admitting that they watched wrestling. They loved it. They would take their kids and things like that. And it was like for the first time I started seeing people outside of pro wrestling in terms of in, in the public eye, um, like stars, like actors and actresses and 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 musicians coming to the shows. And Oh, know, remember like, the Staples Center in the pond? I mean, oh, yes. it was loaded with A-list. I mean, A-listers. I mean, it was incredible to see them you know, and the word, you know, fanboy, you know, for so many of us and say, I know who you are, you know, and such as that. I remember going to do a, um, an appearance with uh, Sue Aitchison, you know, and we were in New York City and they had the, uh, the New York Giants, um, the Super Bowl champions, you know, um, and I remember talking to some of them and I'm a big fan, you know, Carl Banks, all that. I was a big fan. I was like, Hey, how you doing? You know, I'm Devon Hughes. He didn't say Devon Dudley because not everybody knows. And he was like, I know who you are, Devon. He was, I was like, Oh, <laughs> you know, and that, that freaking, that warmed my right. heart. because I'm what this guy is a legend, you know, and the future hall of famer. He's in the hall of fame now, but you know, these guys were legends, you know, and for them to say they knew who I was before I even introduced myself and that, Hey, we watch you all the time. It was incredible. It really was just like when we were on wall street, remember we did the wall street thing and we were yeah. outside and we're walking from wall street um, to the, uh, I think it was to the bus and how we were being mobbed. And I always said, I don't know what Michael Jackson or Prince or Mad Madonna felt like, but for that one split second, yeah. I got a little glimpse of what they felt because we were being trampled and mobbed. The police had to escort us in. It was it was an incredible time. I had the same thing with the two tall Jones. I was at a uh, autograph signing years ago, and I'm sitting right beside two tall. This is one of my idols. You know, I right. grew up. I grew up. I watched almost every game he played. I watched and mm -hmm. lived and died with him. And I'm just sitting there. I'm so nervous. I can't even talk to him. You know, I mean, this, you know, he was nice as he could be. And at the end of the autograph session, when the line started getting down with rent relief, he, he looked over and goes, hey, uh, hey, John, can I get a signed picture? And when he did, I go, yeah, and can I get a football and a helmet and a signed picture? And <laughs> <laughs> I've got all that stuff now. I get up in my everything. I was so excited that two tall Jones, that, not just that he wanted, I, that I was able to talk to him. It's incredible how, the people in whether it's actors or actresses, you know, um, singers or what have you, or athletes in general that we've watched on TV or that have accomplished huge, you know, feats in life, for them to sit there and to say and ask us for autographs or even say, hey, I love I love what you guys do. Keep up the good work. That was so that's when I knew that I was doing something right and that I had made the right decision to choose pro wrestling over football. I mean, yeah. again, I, I just, you know, even if I, chances of me making it to the NFL or even making it to a college that, you know, it's slim to none, you know, but well, even if you I do get, the average NFL career is 2.8 years, you know, it's, that's it's short. about it. And who's to say that I would have lasted even that long, right. you know, if, if I would have made it, you know, so my thing, but I knew, in, I knew pro wrestling was my calling. And you know, you know that, that's the mind, that's the mindset that we all have because we're all old time, old school guys, and you know it was just cramped in our mind. You know, you're professional wrestlers, you're professional wrestlers. You know, you got that tunnel vision. You think nobody outside of our little tunnel knows about mm -hmm. us. But when you when you get you know, get out like that, and that, thanks to the attitude error and all that, we were out there, so everybody knew about us. So that that mindset that we all grew up with, hey, we're professional wrestlers. Don't don't venture outside of there. That goes just completely away when you see these guys. 
and it yeah. does it does spark something in your mind you know that hey man i'm doing the right thing <laughs> exactly it really does and I, i'm just very proud and honored that i had you know the career that i've had you know i thank my family for standing by my side my co-workers at the time for standing by my side believing in me and most importantly god you know um I, there was so many times where i wasn't sure about myself whether i was in the business or not but yet my faith kept me strong and you know it, it really helped me in so many ways when the storm would come and i knew i was hurting or i knew i needed advice i would pray and things would be a lot better you know after i was done i you know growing up in a in a household with a with preachers really showed me you know how to you know count on god and how to have faith and if you have the faith of a mustard seed that's all you need the bible says and you can tell that mountain to move as long as you have that faith and i believe in that so much even during my trials and tribulations going through some of the things that i've gone through in this business with my stroke that i've had in 2020 november 13th and the back surgery i mean i tell people all the time i'm like i'm a walking <laughs> walking miracle i mean i had a stroke then i had brain surgery then I had, I was bleeding internally. I was all messed up and had no idea, you know, God fixed that. And then I was going through what I was going through with my back and they had the fuse um, L3, L4. And then when they cut me open, they saw L uh, S1 was real bad. It was actually collapsing. So they went in and, and, and fixed that. They put the titanium bolts and all that in there. And two hours after coming out of surgery, I was walking, trying to get myself together wow. again. And I, you know, I was, you know, I prayed to God. I said, I don't want to be one of those guys that uses it as a crutch. You know, well, you had brain surgery, you had a stroke and you had back surgery. You know, I'm just an old man. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, whatever. No, I was back into the gym. I was with my rehab uh, person. We were going, you know, nonstop. And even to this day, even after back surgery, I mean, my surgery was February 15th and I'm already in the gym with my trainer trying to get myself together. I'm even taking yoga now. <laughs> well, trying to, you know, straight, you know, get the legs loose. He's done a lot of things for a lot of people. DDP, DDP is a godsend, man. He, he is. I called him. So I've, I've sent him a notes a couple of times, just randomly. It's really cool what you've done for X or yeah. done for this. I mean, he's what a good man. He really is. And I, I called him and said, Hey, listen, man, I just had this back surgery and I've seen what you've done with people that have had something similar to that. I was like, you know, he was like, well, come on down, you know, and I'll definitely do it. But at that time, I couldn't fly or do anything. So I was stuck at home. And I was just like, all right, I'll do it. But then I found somebody here that actually in Florida that actually, you know, uh, well, when he does almost like the DDP yoga. And he's he was influenced by DDP. So we do that here. And it's opened up my world like you wouldn't believe. I mean, again, I shouldn't even be getting out of bed right now. You know, after February 15th, you know, I should be still trying to be, you know, help getting myself up and things like that. But yet I'm out of the bed. I'm I'm doing what I'm doing. And the fusion is, is working great. They said I just took x-rays today right before the show, which is why I was late. <laughs> and uh, they said that it's going really good. You real know, late. So, yeah, yeah, real late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Hey, you know, you'll understand this. We had Rikishi on there, you know, who you know, just like everybody, we all, you know, love, you know, what a, what a, I love, what a good man. And his boys, those, those, so I, man, you talk about, talk about a team that could dethrone you guys as oh, I'm, goats. No question. Those when kids asked, are freaking awesome. Phenomenal. When they but, asked me this, they said, Devon, do you mind if we do 3D? I said, hell yeah. I said, do it, take it. I said, <laughs> oh, Yo, we don't do that no more. I said, listen, I'm passing the torch. <laughs> And Rikishi Absolutely. said, was talking about, you know, the business, you know, and looking back on it now, how cool it is to kind of be one of the old guys and, and not be bitter, you know, and he, mm -hmm. he said, and, and his phrase was, we made it through. Yeah. You know, and, and you understand that well, you know, we made yeah. it through and we now we get to look back and, you know, I, I don't understand anybody being bitter. It's such a wonderful no. business. And I, I really love is. what these kids are doing now. Yeah. I don't always understand it, but, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I love it. <laughs> and, you know, and, and John, to, to what you just said, you know, Again, we're, we're not bitter, not to mention I'm still working. I'm in NXT now, and I love working with the younger talent. And I don't feel jealous like I have to go on, the, on, on NXT TV and try to prove myself or try to get myself into the mix. I'd rather be behind the scenes, coaching, teaching, and making sure that my vision 
of what they're giving me to give to these kids, they're actually doing it and handing the home run with it. And I love that. I get more satisfaction out of that now than actually getting in the ring. I don't want anything to do with that ring no more. <laughs> <laughs> that ring hurts. Yes, God. When I see half the stuff that they do today, I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, absolutely not. No, 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 no. I remember right before me and Bubba came back, I was speaking to Road Dog. And, you know, he was telling me, he's like, Devon, he's like, me being in the ring with Usos, man, they hurt. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean they hurt? He goes, man, he's like, you know, the, the it's like each generation gets bigger and stronger, you know? And so now you're in there and you're older. It's not like you're 25 anymore, you know? You're in there, you're almost, you're, you're in your 40s, almost maybe in your 50s, unless you're Billy Gunn and that's different. Oh yeah, <laughs> Billy Gunn is like Jonathan Winters and yeah. working men. He's, he's, he's aging backwards. Yeah, I'm like, what the, I look and I go, Billy, what the hell are you doing? I was like, look at you and you're still getting in the ring and taking these uh, crazy bumps and you're getting hit. We all got old. He got to be an Avenger. Yeah. <laughs> all Billy does look at you and smile. Oh, yeah. he, he just laughs. He, just laughs he looks so like, freaking oh, good. I hate him. I absolutely hate yeah. him. I'm like, I ain't taking my shirt off in front of you no more. No, no, not if Billy. Not as long as Billy's on the planet, I'm not taking my shirt off. No, absolutely not. <laughs> Put me to shame. Hey, Devon, you know, before we go, I want I do want to ask you about talk coming back. The the night in Brooklyn. You know, sometimes when you come back, you know, and, and I, I was there uh, with Ron in right. Tallahassee one time. And I, you know, it's hard to compare great ovations, you know, like Stone Cold, you know, Hogan or what you guys in Brooklyn, what Ron got in Tallahassee that day was, oh, I right. never heard anything like it. The whole crowd's mm -hmm. doing the, the chop and they're going nuts. Yes. That day in Brooklyn, you know, sometimes you get these things in life and you, you'll never you get you get to experience them you may never get it again but you got it that night and mm -hmm. that's something you'll take to to your grave one day which hopefully is a long long time away uh, yes. but what was it like that night to come out and get that reaction in brooklyn i think it was right after SummerSlam. right after SummerSlam, you know it was an incredible feeling it showed me because i know so many years i always felt that maybe the fans didn't appreciate bubba and i um, you know, and things like that, because, you know, you read certain things on social media and it's always the people that are, uh, like don't have any knowledge whatsoever about the business and how things really work. Those are the ones that you hear the loudest as opposed to the people that might like you and that might put you over. But I always felt that me and Bubba always got the raw end of the deal on that in terms of some of the fans. And, you know, that night in Brooklyn, it just it solidified everything for me because to sit up there and to see that ovation from 15 to 18,000 people in Brooklyn cheering, jumping up and down because we had been going for 10 years, you know, we had spent time in TNA and it was just, it was an incredible, incredible feeling. Um, I, you know, I got goosebumps. I actually called my wife. I said, you know what, if I die tomorrow, you tell everybody I'm happy. <laughs> you know, I got that pop that I had been looking for my whole career. And it took me being gone for 10 years to actually get it, you know, from the WWE universe. I was so happy and so ecstatic. And I told my kids when I got home, I said, that's what I had been pushing and looking for my whole career. And I finally got it. I was so happy. And like I told my wife, I said, I can die happy. You make sure you put on my tombstone, he's happy now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like uh, Cena. You know, Cena, when he was, you know, as hot as a fire, you know, hot as, as anybody in the history of the business. Right. They, 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 the fans would love to, let's go Cena, Cena sucks. Right. Now when he's gone a while, people realize what they miss. Same yeah. like you guys. They realize what they had. Yeah. And when Cena goes out now, the place just goes ballistic. You know, they because they're like, I don't know how much more we're going to have with this guy. So we're going to get everything we can out of it. Yep. And, you know, it's one of those things where, again, when I saw grown, like, you know, grown men were crying and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> crying. <laughs> I, I can see girls crying, but you a grown ass man. <laughs> said, no, no. That's you that's because their grandfathers watched you growing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is something when you see some like a uh, 50 year old man like with grandkids go i watched you growing up I'm like, yeah stop. that's what gets me that's like yeah yeah some some guy just did that to me the other day he goes 
man, I watched you when I was a kid. I was like, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, either you failed math or you just not registering what you're saying to me right now. <laughs> if, you like, guys, if you guys are fortunate to get to my age, it's when they, when, when they, one of these kids that come up, my, my grandmother thought you were cute back in her day. <laughs> Your grandmother. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, you know, I turned 50 August 1st. So, you know, I, if, uh, looking at 50 and 60, I'm like, yeah, they're hot. <laughs> so, I'm looking at that now, you know, where, where before, you know, you when I was younger, it was like, man, that's, that woman's going to be my grandmother or my mama. I was like, I can't. Now <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I, like now I'm, I'm like, yo, man, she hot. <laughs> I'm like, she's 60 years old, about to be 70, but she hot as hell right now. Because <laughs> I look at it this way. You know, I ain't looking at the young girl going, man, she hot. Cause they looking at me going, get your old ass out of here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The old woman, the yeah. older woman can't say that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The hey, what will we talk that. to them about anyway? You know, exactly. I know nothing about TikTok. No. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it took everything in my power to able to transfer what you gave me to my laptop so I can actually have this is the first time I've ever used a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> And I did it by myself. <laughs> That's an accomplishment there. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm going to bed happy tonight. Yeah, every time I get on this this show, I, I feel you should have seen us in the beginning. I mean, it was oh. it was awful. But we, you know, we've had people that uh, that that outdid me. Uh, uh, Stan Hansen. It took us over an hour to get him on the line. And poor <laughs> old God bless Timmy uh, Timmy White's soul that. Uh, Timmy, Timmy got so mad at John and I. We regret that we didn't ever get with him afterward, but uh, he, right. he disappeared. He, he just threw his phone out the window and said, to hell with you guys. Yeah, he hung up on us. He got, Tim White got mad at us because he didn't know how to use his phone. That's great. And he finally cusses at us and hangs up on us and won't pick up when we called him. <laughs> it was great. I saw him right before he died, and he, he goes, Hey, I, I'm going to come on your show. We just had a little technical problem. I said, no, you had a technical problem. <laughs> we didn't have we nothing. Did. You did. You did. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> well, Devin, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I know you had to go to the doctor and do all this stuff. And uh, Yeah, no, know. it was a pleasure. And I remember I, I came to you about three years ago. I said, I want to, I want to do something with you. I want to do a show with you. I want to. You know, Absolutely. I podcast and I was I was eager. So when I got the phone call from Mr. Briscoe, I was like, hell yeah, there was no hesitation. Yeah. I was like, man. But then all of a sudden, when I found that I was supposed to do it yes, you know, Tuesday, I was like, oh man, I got an NXT. Now, how do I I was like, how do I go to them and tell them after only being there three weeks? Listen, I I, I can't I can't put the match together right now with the young guys because I gotta do this interview with with Bradshaw and Mr. Yeah, Briscoe. the girl with Bradshaw like, and Briscoe. Yeah, I was like, wait, they were like, wait a minute. So I was like, Mr. Briscoe, please, can we do it tomorrow? And then he was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then all of a sudden, I get a phone call. Mr. Hughes, we got to take you today. We got to cancel your appointment for next week and put it in today because the doctor won't be here next week. Can you come in? I was like, um, well, when's the next time I can come in? They were like, well, he probably won't, you probably won't see him for about another month and he has to get these x-rays in. I was like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> and I was just about to call Mr. Briscoe. Well, you did call me. And you did call me. And I answered the phone and you said, Mr. Briscoe. And I said, yes, sir. And Devon, you said, hey, or is it, what is it? The appointment being canceled or moved or something? Like, what are you talking about? You yes. Said, wait, wait, wait a minute. I got the wrong number. You got the wrong number. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah. Jerry, Jerry, he's got 18 phones. <laughs> I know it. I, I don't know which number to call. You know, I don't know how many are burner phones. Online. I don't know why WWE. a person has 18 phones anyway. Hold on. When WWE said, hey, you need a phone? Yep. Yep. Need a laptop? Yep. Yep. Need an iPad? Yep. I raise my hand every single time. Don't throw away the box. Yeah. <laughs> I figured I'm gonna get the hell, I'm gonna get everything I can out of this. <laughs> well, man, brother, we sure appreciate this. It's been a fun hour and a half or whatever, man. Uh, you're welcome back anytime. Maybe we yes. can get the get the Dudley clan on there for a family reunion one time. It'd be awesome. <laughs> yes, I would do anything for you guys. Thank anything. You. So I would we love, love you, Devin. Anything. We've always been good <laughs> friends, and I'm I'm so happy you're now working with the kids down at NXT, but I'm more happy Thank now you. that. That, that I that I get to see and talk to you. You know, last time we were at TV, you and I sat in catering for about an hour, just laughed and talked and had fun. 
Sure did. And talking about old times. And that's one of the greatest things I love about seeing you guys is because we can sit back and talk about all the great memories. People always sit there and talk about a time machine. The time machine is actually getting with the person that you created history with and going back and talking about it. That's that's the time machine right there. Not like, you know, back to the future movie with with uh, uh, what's the name Fox and and getting in some car and going back to the time. It's actually sitting yeah. back and reminiscing about the great times you know you had with each other. And we've had some great times. Oh. And again, I can't thank God enough for putting me in WWE at the time to meet you guys and to help create history, to help put the Attitude Era on the map. I'm so happy and so thankful and so blessed that I had the opportunity to do that. I got to bring up one thing, though. You know, I go out a lot of these autograph sessions like you guys do. People said, you know, you're 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 up there in age when 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 you were doing that. I mean, what what the most frightful you was the, the entire time? You know, you took all the guys finished. I said, I got to tell you the truth. It was the night I was sitting on the top rope. I think it was in Richmond, Virginia, and you guys put me through a table. Yes, I mean, I said, I, I've TV. never been so scared in my life or something because, <laughs> but and I kept thinking, you know, if May May Young can do this at 88 years old, oh boy, yo yo part, you can do it too. So, <laughs> oh boy, I like, so I like tell me. us a little bit about May before we go. I mean, that's a story that we got to touch on before we go, and then you we'll know, let it, you go. Yeah, it was one of those things where May Young, I like what Bubba likes to say, May Young was the toughest man that he had ever been in the ring. With. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was truly, she was, she was great, and she was willing to do anything in that ring with us, regardless. Most women her age are worried about falling breaking a hip or what have you she was willing to go off that top rope through that table off the stage and then she came to me and Bubba I think it was in Houston at the compact center and said you know what I'm going to try to talk Vince into having a steel cage and having you guys put me on top of the cage and putting me through and we just went what wait a minute no and I remember telling Bubba you do that. I'm not doing that one. <laughs> she came to you one time and said, do it like you do one of the town and quit doing treat me special, right? Mm-hmm. She sure did. She, I think she actually slapped Bubba because I think Bubba was being very ginger with her. And she grabbed his arm and said, come here, hot shot. And she was like, when you hit me, you hit me like one of the boys. And she went, bam. And I went, I went, got it, May. Got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, May, I'm good. May, I'm, I'm good. good. I'm, I understand I'm good. what you got. I'm good. I, I, I'm going to hit you like one of the boys. You're like, you're like, May, I'm good. But if you want to slap Bubba again. Slap him. <laughs> by all that's means. Fine. I don't think Bubba got the message. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I got it just fine, but Bubba's slow. He, yeah, you know, you got to talk. Wanna, you got you to do it. You might want to hit him again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Devon, thanks so much, man. I tell your twins, I said hello to them. John, I used to go over in Lakeland and watch it, watch his twins wrestle in the Florida State Championship. Man, they were studs too. So yeah, they uh, were what, really what a good, what a good set of twins you have there. So please thank you very much. Regards along to them.